I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. What have they done? Hello and welcome to The Book Was Better. We're fixing today's movies one book at a time. And I hope you all brought your canteens because this is going to be one long, dried out ball of confusion. What? Love it or hate it, Dune is one of the most famous science fiction novels of all time. It's a difficult read, yes, and some of that is from obfuscated text, but much of it is also from the depth and complexity that Dune sets forth to create. It might also come across as intimidating to some readers because this book is huge. Written in 1965 by author Frank Herbert, Dune didn't just win the coveted Nebula Award for Best Novel, it won the very first Nebula Award ever. It won critical praise from other science fiction masters such as Arthur C. Clarke, who said, I know nothing comparable to it except Lord of the Rings, and Robert Heinlein, who said Dune was powerful, convincing, and most ingenious. Dune tells the tale of Paul Atreides, the son of Duke Leto Atreides, set 10,000 years in the future. The Atreides have won the right to mine the spice melange from the planet Arrakis, also known as Dune. The spice is one of the rarest and most sought-after resources in the galaxy, allowing for intergalactic travel, extended lifelines, and developing psychic powers. This move gives House Atreides a chance to rise in power and authority among the galactic nobility known as the Landsrod, but the whole thing was a trap set by the Emperor Shaddam IV and House Harkonnen. What starts as a political rivalry soon erupts into a fight for survival as Paul and his mother are plunged into the deadly desert of Dune, where if dehydration doesn't kill them, the massive sandworms will. Dune was such a hit that talk of creating a movie adaptation started shortly after its publication. The movie rights were initially sold in 1971, and what started as a labor of love for some soon turned into a financial and logistical nightmare for hundreds of people involved. It was first optioned by producer Arthur P. Jacobs, one of the men behind the original Planet of the Apes, who couldn't finish it in time because he died. Blech. It was then picked up by John Paul Gibbon, with Alejandro Jodorowsky brought on to direct. They had a cast lined up, including Salvador Dali, David Carradine, and Jodorowsky's own son cast to play Paul. The crew also included H.R. Geiger for set and character design, and Pink Floyd and Magma for music. However, because they ran out of money, Jodorowsky's Dune never saw the light of day, though their efforts had a positive effect on later films. Alien, for example, shared much of the same creative team. Jodorowsky's attempts were eventually compiled in a 2013 documentary called Jodorowsky's Dune. The film rights were sold yet again in 1976, this time to Italian producer Dino De Laurentiis. De Laurentiis commissioned Frank Herbert himself to write a new script, then hired Ridley Scott to direct. Scott intended to split the movie into two parts, and considering the length of the book, it would have been a good move. However, he dropped out after his older brother died of cancer. So yet another new director had to be found, and De Laurentiis' daughter approached David Lynch for the opportunity. Lynch was recognized for his successes with directing Eraserhead and The Elephant Man, and in 1981 was being approached for several directing gigs, including Return of the Jedi. Lynch ended up taking the job with Dune, agreeing to direct and write the screenplay, even though he had not read the book, didn't know the story, and hadn't even been interested in science fiction at the time. Lynch and his crew went through a myriad of trials, building 80 sets on 16 different sound stages, going through seven versions of the script, and working with a total crew of 1,700 people. When it came time to finally show the movie to the world, Lynch and his crew were invited to present it at the Kennedy Center. Publicity was high and everyone was pumped up for a thrilling night. And that's when the negative reviews started hitting. Lynch's planned three-hour movie had to be cut to just over two hours, as demanded by the film's financiers, Universal Studios. Condensing an 800-page book to a 137-minute runtime turned out to be too much for Lynch and his crew to handle. The New York Times said Dune was perilously overloaded. Siskel and Ebert listed Dune as the worst movie of 1984. Because Dune, one of five science fiction films being released this holiday season, 
is the worst, according to me, by a wide margin. It's physically ugly. It contains at least a dozen gory gross-out scenes. Some of its special effects are cheap, surprisingly cheap, because this film cost a reported 40 to $45 million, and its story is confusing beyond belief. In case I haven't made myself <laughs> clear, I hated watching this film. I wish I could have left after 20 minutes. I couldn't. I had to stay there another two hours. The movie only pulled in $30 million during its theatrical run, dooming it forever to be known as a box office bomb. Universal Studios approached Lynch about releasing a director's cut of Dune, but Lynch declined every offer they gave him, preferring not to even acknowledge the movie during interviews. With a complicated history like that, mistakes and rush jobs were bound to come up, but Dune has taken on something of a cult following in recent years. Could these new fans be onto something, or is Dune really just an embarrassing tangled mess? Well, let's not wait any longer. This is Dune, a big blockbuster bastardization. So the movie wastes no time giving us two things I'll get really sick of. Exposition and bland, expressionless dialogue. The beginning is a very delicate time. Already bored. Forget about the weirding ways. Have you seen these things? They call it a dune buggy. I'm gonna go jump this thing off one of these dunes. <laughs> this is Princess Irulan. She's entirely irrelevant in this movie and was mostly so in the book as well, finally revealing herself and becoming more of a political object than a real character in the last five pages. She's just here to give us the initial exposition dump. Fun fact though, this whole scene was just a cheap rewrite. When Universal told Lynch that he would have to cut 40 minutes of his movie's runtime, he had to scrap his original intro and got Virginia Madsen here to give a short monologue. Princess Irulan sets up the story for us, tells us about her father, the Spacing Guild, the Spice, the planet Arrakis, the Fremen, and the prophecy of a chosen one who will bring them to salvation and glory. And she does this all in the span of two minutes. The Spacing Guild and its navigators, who the Spice has mutated over 4,000 years, use the orange Spice gas, which gives them the ability to fold space. Good God! I've had professors give me less material for final exams! The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune. Is this going to be on the test? So, did you like that exposition dump? Well, fuck you! Have another one! As soon as the opening credits close, we get a dump about the planets of our story, the heads of the noble houses, and a possible plot to disrupt spice production. God knows we can't have that! The spice must flow. The spice must flow! We zoom into planet Kaitane, where we see the Emperor of the Known Universe, his entourage, and we get to hear the music enjoyed by the most politically powerful rulers in the universe. What the fuck is this shit? I have no idea what this noise is supposed to be. It's rhythmic, so it could be music, but it just sounds like someone slamming their forehead onto an organ keyboard. And to think people complained about dubstep. Oh gods, we barely started this movie and I've already complained this much. The Emperor is visited by members of the Guild, the company that holds a monopoly on spice distribution and are so rich that they get to boss around the Emperor of the Universe. The Bene Gesserit witch must leave. Leave us. Yes, my lord. Thank God we don't live in a world like that. Oh. Right. The guild members present were accompanied by a third stage navigator, a respected and powerful- WHAT THE FUCK?! <coughs> <coughs> Holy hell, that thing looks like some sort of a scrotal peanut fetus. A note to all future movie makers. When designing alien creatures, don't model them after someone's moldy ball sack! I shouldn't even have to say that! 
The guild is upset because the Emperor recently took the contract for spice production away from the powerful noble house, House Harkonnen, and gave it to the lesser family, House Atreides. However, he has a reason. The Atreides house is building a secret army using a technique unknown to us, a technique involving sound. The Duke is becoming more popular in the Lansrad. He could threaten me. Yep. House Wars. In the book, the Emperor did this because the Atreides were becoming more popular in the Lanstrad, and he didn't want a political rival to compete with. The Guild sees the Atreides as a threat too, so they don't interfere with the Emperor's schemes. We ourselves will see a slight problem within House Atreides. Paul. Paul Atreides. There is only one threat to our plans, and his name is Paul. Speaking of Paul, he's hanging out on planet Caladan. He's played by Kyle MacLachlan and is studying the universe in general. We get to learn about life on Arrakis and different classes of people, like the Mentats, who are basically human computers, and the Bene Gesserits, who are an ancient sisterhood who controlled genetic bloodlines to create the Kwisatz Haderach, a powerful man of prophecy. So yeah, more fucking exposition! The Baron Harkonnen has sworn to destroy House Atreides and steal the Ducal Signet Ring for himself. Twelve minutes. I... We're 12 minutes in, and we're still getting background information spoon-fed to us! I could take a quiz on the places and things in this story, but I don't know thing one about any of the characters or why I should care about them. It's all given so quickly, so blandly, and with so few fucks that there's no possible way to care about any of it! There, Arrakis. Weather. Sea storms. No precipitation. Please, just have something. ANYTHING INTERESTING HAPPEN! Wait, wait a minute. Is that...? IT IS! PATRICK FUCKING STEWART! God, something to care about! The troubadour soldier Gurney Halleck was a classicist battlemaster, always ready with a pithy quote or a song. My father sent you to test me. Music, then? No music. I'm packing this for the crossing. Shield practice. Shield practice? Gurney, we had practice this morning. I'm not in the mood. Not in the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle and love play, not fighting. I'm sorry, Gurney. Not sorry enough. Gurney takes none of your shit! And they thrust themselves into combat. And... okay. Those shields couldn't have looked good even in 1984. These Cubist nightmares might be the worst special effects in the movie. If Dune had a smaller production budget, I'd be a little more forgiving. However, it had a budget of 40 million dollars. Adjusting for inflation, that's over 92 million dollars today. Even with all the set pieces and costumes they wanted, they could have set aside something for better looking shields. But maybe it's just a limitation of technology. You might be thinking, the movie was made a long time ago, special effects weren't as good back then. And to an extent you'd be right, except 1984 is also the year that brought us... Conan the Destroyer, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, The Never Ending Story, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Gremlins, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, The Terminator, and Ghostbusters. Age is not a goddamn excuse here. Paul's training continues when the Reverend Mother Gaius Mohiam, truth sayer to the Emperor himself, comes to test the young man. She came to find out his potential by forcing him to put his hand inside of a box that stimulates his pain receptors. A box of pain, if you will. What's in the box? Uh, what's in the box? Not you, give me the what's gun. in the fucking box? Plus, this is where we get Paul's fear is the mind killer speech. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. What's noteworthy is that this is the first scene we're given that doesn't load us down with exposition, so the movie's already taken a step up. What's sad is that we're 25 minutes in when the scene starts. And we still know barely anything about the characters as people. Next, we arrive on planet Getty Prime, home of House Harkonnen. And if you thought scrotum face was bad, wait until you see the planet of the red-headed stepchildren. The Mentat Piter Dereez is perhaps the most normal character, even though he sounds like a philosophy student who hasn't slept in a week. 
It is by will alone I set my mind in motion. It is by the juice of sapu that thoughts acquire speed. The lips acquire stains. The stains become a warning. It is by will alone I set my mind in motion. Doctors stand around with their ears sewn shut, some with pegs in their eyes. I don't even know what that thing is, but the sound alone grosses me out. And of course, Baron Vladimir Hart. <coughs> you know you're only doing this to yourself by watching these stupid movies, right? This looks like something out of a Silent Hill game. The doctors are creepy. You are so beautiful, my Baron. Your skin love to me. The culture and everything here is either disgusting or it doesn't make sense. Or both. I have no idea what's going on here. I mean, what is that stuff? Oil? Blood? Diet Coke? And the Baron is a loud idiot riddled with disease who's so fat he can't move himself and depends on an anti-gravity jumpsuit just to get around. As you instructed me, I have enlightened your nephews concerning my plan. My plan! The plan. He's somehow a less attractive version of Crew from Jack and Daxter. <laughs> the underground will take anyone with a pulse these days. And then there's the direction. Watch this clip. Bring in Fade and Rabat! And pause for effect. And pause again for the close up to show we got Sting to play Fade. And now we continue. Now, did that seem natural or in any way realistic? No, it didn't. It was stilted and awkward. In terms of direction, this all just screams of some wannabe artistic bullshit. Alright, so Tracy, you'll enter in a Hawaiian French maid's outfit and start pouring ranch dressing all over the grass. Tony, you'll crab walk in and start filing taxes. I think you're letting this get to your head. Why am I wearing a trench coat when it's 100 degrees outside? Oh yeah, and fun fact, in Jodorowsky's Dune, Fade was set to be played by Mick Jagger. Is there something about this part that just screams musical accompaniment? In the book, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen was a cunning, devious man. He was cutthroat, he was power hungry, and he was vengeful. So far the only thing the movie's gotten right was that the Baron was a fat man who needed anti-gravity to move. Plus there's this implied rape scene fitted in, possibly to match the implied pedophilia from the book. It's like Lynch went out of his way to make the Baron as visually and morally disgusting as possible. If this fat tub of lard wasn't so well guarded, then he could be easily taken out by a moderately armed child. At least this scene gives us some more plot development and one of the more famous lines from the movie. He who controls the spice controls the universe. And what Pyta did not tell you is we have control of someone who is very close, very close to Duke Leo. Skipping ahead a little, it's finally time to go to Arrakis. The Atreides and their staff are loaded up onto these spaceships that look suspiciously like rice. And those ships are loaded onto another ship that looks like one of those wooden pegs you use to build furniture with. We get to see space folding as a guild navigator comes back. Gods, that thing looks terrible. And he fires energy beams out of his mouth, which looks suspiciously like a vagina. Okay, I want to know who designed this thing. Who brought this into the world? What twisted motherfucker? I hate people. The fourth planet in our movie tonight is Arrakis, also known as Dune. The Harkonnens, being the sore losers they are, have booby-trapped the palace and spice mining facilities. In fact, it's during one of these inspections that they meet Dr. Kynes, ecologist, imperial servant, and long-term friend of the Fremen. Are you a Fremen? I've been on Arrakis in the service of the Emperor long enough for my eyes to change. Sadly, this is one of the better examples of exposition. Being exposed to spice for long periods of time can change one's eyes so they appear blue within blue. This scene doesn't really tell you about the spice connection, but it does give an easy indicator of who is a Fremen. Moving on, Dr. Kynes takes the Duke, Paul, and Gurney on a tour of the spice mining facilities when they discover a sandworm torpedoing towards the crawler. Worm sign. Is it worm sign? 
Don't leak out moving! Don't leak out moving! Stop that! Yeah, I had to bring this up. Plenty of people claim that the MST3K movie sign shout came from Dune's worm sign. I haven't been able to find anything that definitively says that's true, but come on. A show that mocks bad sci-fi movies taking a cue from one of the worst sci-fi flops of all time? Sounds like a pretty safe bet to me. As the worm draws close, the Duke learns that the Harkonnens also sabotaged the carryall meant to fly the spice miner away, so the entire crew on board the crawler is likely to die, either due to the worm's attack or exposure in the desert. However, the Duke orders the workers to abandon the spice and save themselves, piling a few of them onto his personal jet. Two men in each of the spotters! You're the And this leads us to a scene that I actually kind of like as the sandworm overtakes the crawler. Gods, what a monster. It looks good, uses practical effects, and gives a solid hint at the size of the sandworms. And sadly, it's easier to notice the bad effects over the good ones. Unfortunately, Duke Leto's rule does not last as the Harkonnens make their move. A traitor inside the castle lowers the shields and allows the Harkonnen troops and Imperial Special Forces, the Sardaukar, inside to kill everyone in sight. Duke Leto himself is attacked by the traitor, Dr. Yui, confidant and friend. But instead of simply handing the Duke over to the Baron, Dr. Yui implants a poisonous tooth into the Duke's mouth. When Duke Leto bites down and exhales, he'll spit out a poisonous gas with which he can kill the Baron. When you see the Baron, remember the tooth. The tooth. The tooth. This seems like a high cost to pay just to kill one bastard. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. As the death and destruction unfolds all around, we get what I would call the only real scene dedicated to character. No exposition, no plot advancement, not even dialogue. Just character. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> this is refreshingly good. It's simple, and the narrowing camera angle gives a sense of smallness and personal responsibility. This is also one of the few times his character doesn't speak in a dull monotone. I could only wonder what this movie would play out like if we had more scenes like this. Sadly, we can't stay on something enjoyable for too long. As soon as we finish the scene with Dr. Yui, we get... this. I want to spit once on your head. Just some spittle in your face. <coughs> what a luxury. Lovely. Baron Harkonnen has gone from cunning, devious monarch to obnoxious older brother. The Baron orders Paul and his Bene Gesserit mother Jessica to be thrown out to the desert for the sandworms to devour. But what the Harkonnens failed to consider was Paul's Bene Gesserit training and his ability to use the voice. No, not that one! The voice is the Bene Gesserit ability to control people just using their voices. Even though in the movie it makes them sound like they need a lozenge. There's no need to fight him for me. Actually, now that I think about it, they kind of sound like rain. NPC! Build me a gun that shoots cough drops! Paul and Jessica are able to overtake their captors and escape to freedom in the desert, but we see the rest of Yui's plan unfold back at the castle. For what? For my life? For Paul? He's crying. He's crying! What does that mean, Peter? It usually means he's sad. You bloated fucktard. The Duke bites down on his tooth like he was supposed to, but because he was drugged, he mistakes Piter for the Baron and kills the wrong asshole. It's still a win, but not the win it could have been. Am I alive? Am I alive? Yes. You're alive, my Baron. <laughs> I'm alive! Eh? I'm alive! The remaining Atreides forces are scattered, with the Atreides mentat Thufir Hawat getting captured by the Baron, I'll talk about that scene later, Swordmaster Duncan Idaho dying in combat, and Gurney leading his troops into battle, going out in a blaze of glory. 
Look, he's even carrying the Duke's pug in his arms. I can't remember a dog in the book, but let's give him some credit. That pug is pretty damn calm for being surrounded by death and fire. Paul and Jessica are stranded in the Southern Pole, where some of the largest sandworms prowl. But before they get eaten by the giant beasts, the surviving Atreides are saved by a band of Fremen, the badass warriors of the harsh deserts of Dune. Such stealth. I didn't hear them. And one joke of a fight scene later, they've both proven themselves to the fierce warrior tribe. Get back! She has the weirding way. And now I have to talk about this little nugget. The weirding way in the book was a style of fighting that was unique to the Bene Gesserits. Paul teaches it to the Fremen in exchange for sanctuary and to make their forces even stronger. However, the movie includes these weirding modules as well. Little boxes powered by the user's voice that creates explosions, set fires, and a few other neat tricks. Well, I wonder what the pitch meeting for those things was like. So, by moting into the microphone, you're able to project energy into the gun and blow shit up. Are you trying to weaponize porn stars? Yui even provided plans for these modules in a survival kit he left for Paul and Jessica. And Paul later teaches the hundred strongest Fremen how to use these weirding modules. In adaptations, things often have to be changed or simplified in order to fit limitations in different mediums, which is fine. But if you were going to substitute the weirding way with these new little sound guns, then why include the weirding way as it was shown in the book? This just baffles me. There was no need to do both. This was largely the greatest use of the Weirding Way in the book, so there was never a need to include these Weirding modules. Narratively, they serve no greater purpose. At best, it gives you a lazy reason why the Fremen were such good fighters, instead of expanding on how only the toughest people can survive Arrakis. And they look fucking ridiculous using these things, too. Hmm? My name is a killing word. It's like watching a bunch of kids walk around using their hands as guns. And that's when you guys finger bang each other. What? Yeah, you know, finger bang, like when you use your hand like a gun. Kids do it all the time. Bang, 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 bang. Why are we still bang. working for him? Bang, haha, <laughs> gotcha. As Paul and Jessica are brought into Fremen society, they're taught how to survive on Arrakis. They're shown the massive water reserves, taught about respecting the sandworms, and Paul is even given a new name, symbolizing his inclusion into Fremen society. What do you call the mouse shadow in the second moon? We call that one Muad'Dib. Could I be known as Paul Muad'Dib? You are Paul Muad'Dib. Oh my god, this is all so stilted. This is as good a time as any to talk about the dialogue. You've already seen the bland exposition dialogue at the beginning, but that evolves into this forced back and forth where they rush as much information out as quickly as possible, no matter how unrealistic or unattractive it sounds. Of course, that all goes hand in hand with the bland expressionless voices the characters use for 90% of the movie. Excuse me, my lady. The Harkonnens may have tampered with them medically. When you said Harkonnens, I didn't know you had so much reason to hate them. What hatred? His voice doesn't even have any inflection! Patrick Stewart is perhaps the only exception to this because, quite frankly, he can't turn the awesomeness off. Who calls Pad 9? Don't mention the Duke. This is an uncoded channel. The Baron is the polar opposite, going so over the top that you hear him, but you cannot possibly take him seriously. Everyone else sounds like they're reading their lines after taking a near-fatal dose of sleeping pills. It's what have killed me. I was his target. He went to the motion. Who are you? I am the Shattered Mapes. The housekeeper. And if I can go on another tangent, let's talk about the pacing. I was going to save this for the summary, but I'll say it now. You cannot safely condense an 800-page book to a two-hour movie. Scenes are clipped together and edited so awkwardly, it feels like we're waking up from a drunken bender, only catching the occasional glimpse of a scene before passing out on the couch for the umpteenth time. Duncan! 
You wish now to join your wife? Is that a traitor? And the entire movie feels like this. I know it's not entirely David Lynch's fault because Universal had him by the balls, but some scenes come and go so quickly that you're given no sense of time progression. The only reason we know Paul spent two years with the Fremen is because the movie flat out tells us. I could go on and on about this, but we have a movie to finish and this review's been going on long enough. But before we move on, I have to mention one more scene with the Harkonnens. And if you thought these assholes were confusing before, check out how they celebrate winning a battle. I have no idea what the fuck any of this means. This is a scene that only a criminally insane art student could conceive. The Baron is floating around a steam vent, someone hung a cow upside down from the ceiling while midgets are scraping something from it, this guy's playing a pipe accordion or something, and Raban just rips something from this cow and eats it. Raban! Raban! I place you in charge of Arrakis. It's yours to squeeze, as I promised. I want you to squeeze, and squeeze, and squeeze! Give me spice! This is like some massively failed attempt at Dadaism! This cannot be Dada! It's too normal to be Dada! It's too shit to be anything else! This is so not the Baron from the book. That Baron could still reasonably be seen in public like the chapter in which he was hobnobbing with the other royals during the gladiator fights. Of course, some of that scene did make it into the movie. Fate. Lovely fate. Does the Baron want to bang his nephew? But that's not all the Harkonnens are doing. Look, they even captured Thufir. We brought you a little cat, Thufa. You must care for it if you wish to live. A poison has been introduced into your body, Thufa Hawad. By milking this, this smooth little cat body, you receive your antidote. It must be done each day. This is ridiculous. They poisoned Thufa in the book, but they administered it and the antidote in secret. That way, if he ever betrayed them, he would just collapse and die. Instead, they give us this cat milking contraption. Why would you reduce the lengthy process of mentally reconditioning a devout wise man to a joke from South Park? <laughs> as time goes by, Jessica is made the Reverend Mother of the Fremen, and Paul has massively increased his standing as well. He learns how to conserve water, how to lead, how to fight, and how not to walk with rhythm on the sand, as doing so would attract a sandworm. And I'm glad they focus on this very important point. I mean, it's not like the Fremen walk in step with each other. We have total dedication to this not walking in rhythm thing. But Paul's final test in the leadership of the Fremen requires him to ride a sandworm, which he does with his demonic shovel. Take the kiss we'll make a hook of our siege and ride as a leader of men. What? Take the kiss we'll make a hook of our siege. What the f are you talking about? Was that even English? Paul climbs to the top of the worm and rides it in one of the more well-known scenes from the movie, and he is rewarded with a new batch of bodyguards. Usul, these are 15 of our finest warriors to serve you as your guard. We smear jam on the shoulders for we are silly. Over the next two years, Paul leads skirmishes and strikes against the Harkonnen's mining operations, destroying crawlers, carriers, and crushing Harkonnen troops. He even meets an old friend along the way. You have no need of your weapons with me, Gurney Halleck. Hey! What a great twist bringing Patrick Stewart back into the movie. This would be even more significant, though, if it didn't come out of fucking nowhere. Don't get me wrong, I like Gurney, but we had no idea that he even could be alive. There were no hints, no foreshadowing, and no build-up to this, so there's little impact to the moment. He just came back out of left field like a plot point that had been all but completely discarded an hour ago. The book took a chapter to explain that Gurney escaped the Harkonnens and joined a group of smugglers. His running into Paul was a coincidence, but a fortuitous one at that. 
Personally, I think the greatest achievement here is that we finally have another actor who can fucking emote. <laughs> We cut to the Emperor, who... Okay, what the fuck is with this music? Is someone's synthesizer broken, or has the Emperor's favorite record been skipping for the last two years? The Guild is not happy that Spice production has halted on Arrakis, and demands that the Emperor do something about it. Emperor Shaddam IV, you have one last chance to take matters into your own hands, and bring the situation under control on Arrakis. You sound like a snarling chihuahua, and your head looks like a leaking egg. How can anyone take you seriously? The Harkonnens cannot stop him. Remedy this situation. Restore spice production. Or you will live out your life in a pain amplifier. So the Emperor is given no choice but to go to Arrakis himself to resolve the issue. But it looks like it's too late as Paul has consumed the deadly water of life, becoming the only man to ever survive drinking it and summoning a power never seen in the universe before. He is now everything the Guild feared he would become. Father, the Sleeper has awakened! Now that he's at the height of his power, both politically and physically, it's time for Paul and the Fremen to take their revenge on the Harkonnen. Paul and the Fremen? Sounds like a 70s band. The Baron arrives on Arrakis to answer for his nephew, Zed, as does the Emperor in his fabulously blinged out ship. Not really sure of how aerodynamic that thing is. The Emperor brought his entire Special Forces army with him, but that won't do much good against what Paul has prepared. As boring or confusing as the rest of the movie has been, this battle plan has got to be one of the most metal things you've ever heard of. The Fremen plan to attack during a massive sandstorm that'll knock out the Harkonnen air power, use atomic bombs to take down the surrounding mountains and shield walls, ride sandworms inside the enemy perimeter while shooting explosive weirding modules at the enemy stuck on the ground, then overtake the castle and demand the unconditional surrender of the Emperor, making Paul the new ruler of the universe. Let's do it! So we've got a hell of an exciting battle ahead of us. How well does the movie pull it off? It starts well but slows down to a snail's pace as everyone, and I mean everyone, is given a chance to get a shot off. Meanwhile, Paul's little sister Alia, born after he and Jessica joined the Fremen, has infiltrated the Emperor's fortress, partially to keep tabs on him and the Baron, but also to harass both of them before Paul shows up. My brother is coming with many Fremen warriors. Impossible! Will somebody please stop headbanging the pipe organ? Despite her small size, Alia has another purpose in the fortress. She keeps the Baron in place. Using telepathy, I guess. Wait for my brother, Baron. Which is weird because she couldn't do that in the book. She also gets a good swipe at him with a gamja bar, a poisonous needle, then rips out his nipple rings, then pushes him out a hole in the wall to a waiting sandworm. If this fat tub of lard wasn't so well guarded, then he could be easily taken out by a moderately armed child. Huh. How accidentally apropos. Thanks to his superior forces, Paul and the Fremen, I still think that's an awesome band name, are able to easily walk over the Emperor's special forces. Paul and his war council meet with the Emperor and immediately take over. Emperor Shaddam IV, there are guild highliners above us containing many great houses of the Landsrad. Send them back. How dare you speak to me in the- Stop your speaking! Yeah, who do you think you are? <laughs> Fucking peasant. Also, Thofir is here for some reason in this shot, looking like a lost ten-year-old, but in the next, he's nowhere to be found. This was because his death scene was cut from the final movie, but they didn't have time or money to reshoot the final scene. This is further evidenced by the reshot intro looking so bare-bones. Thofir's sudden disappearance wasn't the only lapse they made in post-production, but combined with a cat-milking scene, it is one of the more noticeable. Paul spots Fade Rotha and challenges him to a fight to the death. 
And even though Paul starts the fight in a classic, please cut off my hand stance, he kills Fade in the end, then screams so loud that the floors crack. More deep. Russell no longer needs the wearing module. It seems that now, Paul has fulfilled the ancient Fremen prophecy and has brought them to glory. Although, unlike the book, there's no worry about the Fremen's fanaticism running wild and going on a massive rampage throughout the galaxy. Muad'Dib had become the hand of God, fulfilling the Fremen prophecy. We Fremen have a saying. God created Arrakis to train the faithful. One cannot go against the word of God. And so, solidifying himself as an omnipotent figure, Paul somehow summons a storm, causing it to rain on Arrakis for the first time ever. And how can this be? For he is the Kwisatz Haderach! And that was Dune. Did you like it? Could you follow it? I really enjoyed the book. It was a difficult read at first, but the deeper you got into it, the more engrossing it became. Several characters had their own arcs. The world was slowly built up into this massive living being. It was exciting to explore the minute details, and there were multiple themes and messages spread throughout the text. Themes like ecology, the concept of declining empires, gender themes, Zen Buddhism, heroism, and religion all play major roles in telling this story. There are entire chapters dedicated to advancing these ideas instead of advancing the plot. However, the prose can be a little thick to get through sometimes. Context isn't always enough to break down his created words, so Herbert included a dictionary at the end. His writing style is a bit thick, and he does gloss over some things, like the life of Paul's son. And for the most part, the combat scenes are fought off stage, as it were. And for good reason. Dune is Shakespeare. Herbert actually took a lot of inspiration from the Bard, most notably from the plays Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and The Tempest. Thinking of Dune as an homage to Shakespeare's work makes it much easier to read, at least for me. And Dune went on to inspire many other stories, one of the most obvious being Star Wars. Great characters, unique universe, and a fun story. If you're a fan of sci-fi or you want a decent challenge, check out Dune. It gets a 4 out of 5. Now what can I say about the movie? Few things test your patience like sitting through Dune. While not outright terrible or painful to watch, Dune is either a test in patience or in study skills. Watching this is like hearing a movie by bullet points. Plot points and character moments are reduced to summarized blips with no depth or deeper meaning. The design and directing choices make you question the motives of everyone involved. I would say the acting isn't bad at least, but almost all the actors use this dull monotone to speak, putting almost no emotion into their voices. David Lynch himself accepted criticism of his job as director, saying, I started selling out on Dune. Looking back, it's no one's fault but my own. I probably shouldn't have done that picture, but I saw tons and tons of possibilities for things I loved, and this was the structure to do them in. Personally, I don't blame Lynch entirely, since Universal's actions prove they didn't believe in the project. Still, it's not all bad. The practical effects were good, the music was atmospheric and grand in scale at times. Except for this one! and the sound design was nominated for an Academy Award. This wasn't a good movie, but it's hardly the worst I've seen. It gets a 2 out of 5. I think it goes without saying that this movie sucked as an adaptation. And how could it not? How could you take an 800-page book and tell its complex story, lifelike characters, and detailed universe in only two hours? In short, you really can't. Dune bounces around from one major plot point to the next, barely skimming the surface of what made each character unique. You never saw Paul's son, Never saw Gurney search for revenge against Jessica. Never saw the complexities Jessica faced and overcame. And I'm not even sure why they bothered keeping Thufir alive after the assault on the Atreides home since he literally did nothing once he was captured. Scenes come and go as if to say, Oh yes, I forgot to tell you. Plot threads and narrative themes are brushed by so quickly they're more like footnotes. The psychic powers are displayed so disjointedly that you'd almost have to be psychic yourself in order to understand what the hell was going on. In fact, without reading the book, you'd really understand maybe half the movie. Adaptations, no matter how good or bad, should still be able to tell a coherent story without relying on the source material to fill in the blanks. 
Perhaps they did a better job with the 2000 miniseries directed by John Harrison and starring William Hurt. You know it can't be any worse than Lynch's take. As an adaptation, Dune gets a 1 out of 5. 45 minutes, and I still didn't get to everything I wanted to talk about. <sighs> Just as well, though. I ran out of water a while ago. Still, we're two years in, and with luck, we'll last several more. Now, if you guys will excuse me, I have a demon to hunt. How does a cat learn how to lockpick a door? Mm. Hey Crimson, how'd you teach Leia how to... <laughs> Wait, are you still practicing? <laughs> What's it been, like an hour? Hour and a half. <laughs> That's the record, isn't it? And you're not being overwhelmed with emotion. Right now, I have the strongest urge to buy a basket of puppies. And then a farm so they all have room to play. And then a second basket of puppies so the first basket of puppies won't get lonely. Wait, wouldn't the first batch... Never mind. I think you should take a break. I should. Except now, I can do this. <laughs> ha! Hey, Crimson, you feel like getting a smoothie? I feel like getting a smoothie. I love smoothies. Did the same thing to Leia by mistake earlier. She was purring on my lap so hard that my leg fell asleep. Hey, go get your car! We can go out and get some smoothies. Ah! How'd you do that? Where's my jacket? Well, I told you magic's real. I've been training with these things every day since I got them. And you haven't revealed your love for Nick Sparks again? You want another one? I'll shut up. So... I can't have these on too long, but I can have them on just long enough. Long enough to do what? We'll fight Rain, what else? The plan's simple. He attacks, I hit him with one or two of those emotion beams, and that throws him off just long enough for me to use the only other weapon we know works against him. Yeah, but didn't you move here to go into hiding? We don't know where he is, he doesn't know where you are, and even if he did, what can you do to make him show up? You said this guy was unpredictable. He was. But I went back and did some thinking. Raym has attacked me on two occasions, after I reviewed The Christmas Carol and The City of Ember. So? So, what set those movies apart from almost everything else I've reviewed? Uh... Decent soundtrack? No, they... Well, yes, but more importantly, I liked those movies. Then what about Hogfather? That wasn't canon, I was in mourning. No. Raym has never come after me for watching a movie I hated. There's his pattern. But how will you get him to find you? Oh, I took care of that. All I have to do now is hope the psychotic demon brought to life by magic rings who stole my skin has a Facebook account. But what can you watch to get him to attack? You don't seem to like a lot of movies. Oh, I have something. When this first came out, I spent the afternoon doing backflips. It's full of action, comedy, character, and a crap ton of nostalgia. NPC, say hello to the adventures of Tintin. This'll do it. <laughs> 